30 seconds or so. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, whenever you're ready, Chief Melton. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon and Happy New Year. I'm Jessica Melton, the Chief of the Human Trafficking Bureau at the Queen's DA's office. And I wanna thank you all for taking the time out of your very busy days to attend our 2022 Human Trafficking Awareness Month webinar that this year is focused on labor trafficking in our Queen's communities. Assembled on this program is an incredible wealth of expertise um, who I'm very excited to introduce you and who will all graciously um, agree to join and collaborate with District Attorney Melinda Katz in spreading awareness about this horrific crime that deprives so many people from their most basic human rights in our communities. As a quick housekeeping matter, the chat feature has been disabled for security purposes, but you may utilize the question and answer tab on your Zoom screens to ask any questions. We're going to try to answer them as we go along if possible, but we have some time dedicated at the end of the session for the quick Q&A. Um, at the end of this webinar. I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing the person who's responsible for making this event possible. Um, she's a person who cares deeply about the borough of Queens and has spent much of her career in public service working to improve and protect the lives of Queens residents. Elected in November of 2019, Melinda Katz is the first woman to serve as Queens County District Attorney in the city of New York. Since taking office, DA Katz has established the first all-woman leadership team with her chief executive, ADA Jennifer Nyberg, and chief of staff, Camille Chinkifas. Since taking office during an unprecedented time in 2020, District Attorney Katz has led her office through a nationwide pandemic to ensure the safety of more than 2 million people who live and work in this borough. Among her two-year accomplishments are the creation of a conviction integrity unit to restore justice to the wrongfully convicted and a housing and worker protection bureau, which are two of Queens firsts, um, as well as an enhanced community partnership division to strengthen ties to many communities that comprise the most diverse county in America. I can tell you from personal experience that District Attorney Katz has demonstrated through her leadership that eliminating human trafficking and connecting those who have been exploited to help and services is among her top priorities. Within the first six months in office, she created a dedicated human trafficking bureau, the first not only in Queens County, but the first in New York City, um, and it is, she's consistently staffed it with some of the top prosecutors in her office. As a top law enforcement official in the borough of Queens, District Attorney Katz brings a steady community-centered approach to the office while also helping to implement meaningful changes in the criminal justice system. Please help me in welcoming and thanking District Attorney Melinda Katz. Good uh, afternoon, everyone, and a happy new year to everyone, as Jessica said. I wanna welcome everyone here to the Labor Trafficking Awareness Panel. Um, I do wanna thank Jessica Melton. Um, she's the Bureau Chief of Human Trafficking at my office. Before I got here, she was doing it almost all on her own. Uh, and uh, we knew that human trafficking was such an important issue that it had to have a bureau, it had to have the support, it had to have um, the foundation in order for it to be effective, more effective than it had been, although Jessica was doing a great job on her own. Uh, but now she has an entire bureau at her disposal, uh, and I'm very proud of the work that they have been doing. Uh, I'd also like to thank a quick uh, thank you uh, to ADA Kieran uh, Chima, who works very closely with Bureau Chief Melton on obtaining justice for human trafficking victims throughout this entire borough. We also want to welcome you know, great outstanding service providers. We can't do this without the great service providers that work hand in hand with us every single day to help those that got caught up in human trafficking. We can prosecute the traffickers, but we need all of these organizations in order to help uh, the victims, in order to get them uh, out of wherever they are, uh, in order to give them a leg up on their future, uh, in order to give them the foundation that they need to move on 
So I want to thank Dr. Carolyn uh, Griffith Hunt, a human industrial and trauma psychologist. Um, she is the founder and the chair of uh, uh, Created for Greatness Leadership Group. I want to thank Tony Cubello, Director of Education for Trafficking and Advocacy of Lifeway Network. Anita Tika, Senior Director of Anti-Trafficking Programs at Safe Horizon. Uh, we need to thank Alexander Garcia, Workers' Right Ma uh, Manager at New Immigration Community Empowerment, so important to the Borough of Queens County. Uh, we want to thank Estelle Davis, Counsel to the Division of Immigrant Policies uh, and Affairs at the New York State Department of Labor, and Fam Famata uh, Masali, uh, who will share her powerful story of survival uh, and advocacy efforts. Uh, thank you all for coming. Now, January marks the National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, and each of us can help to combat this scourge in our society by knowing exactly how to identify and report suspicious behavior. The statistics are very troubling. As noted in the U.S. Department of State's 2021 Trafficking in Persons Report, the global economic downturn caused by the pandemic increased the number of individuals vulnerable to labor trafficking. While there has been a consistent increase in the ID and investigation and prosecutions of sex traffickers over the past two decades, the same increase has not occurred with respect to labor trafficking. That's why awareness is so important. During Human Trafficking Awareness Month, my office works hard. We bring information about how we can prevent, identify, report labor trafficking that occurs in our Queens communities, and we bring it to the actual communities in order to be able to have an ear on the ground for anyone who might need help. While trafficking is a very real issue on a global scale, it is also unfortunately happening right here in our backyards. Traffickers often use violence, threats, deception, debt bondage, other manipulative tactics to force people to engage in commercial, commercial sex trafficking or provide labor or services against their will. Home to two international airports and to a large number of foreign born undocumented persons, Queens County is unfortunately a prime geographical location for trafficking. We believe here in Queens County that our diversity is the gift that we give the rest of the United States of America, and we need to protect that gift. But this office is committed to combating the degrading and criminal industry. That's why during the first six months in office, I created the dedicated human trafficking bureau. We bring a victim-centric approach that helps victims find their path to freedom. The bureau aggressively prosecutes traffickers, connects survivors to meaningful services, and it empowers them to escape their abu abusers. The Bureau, as led by Jessica Melton, who will be moderating today's panel, takes an aggressive approach towards finding those that are victims of human trafficking and holding those accountable who traffic. A little bit about ADA Melton. She's been a prosecutor with the DA's office for the past 20 years. She started when she was 10. Uh, since 2007, when New York State's first sex and labor trafficking laws took effect 13 years ago, ADA Melton has focused her entire career solely on the prosecution of human trafficking and related crimes. She obtained the first conviction for sex trafficking in New York State and the first labor trafficking conviction in Queens County. In 2013, she was awarded the Thomas E. Dewey Medal by the New York City Bar Association. She's developed innovative approaches to investigate and, prose and prosecute trafficking offense. And under her leadership, the Human Trafficking Bureau works with wonderful service providers like those panelists today um, to provide community outreach education information aimed towards preventing trafficking in our communities and helping victims to reclaim their lives because that's what this is about. So I look forward to uh, working with all of you as we have in the past. I thank you for joining uh, this this uh, meeting today, and we especially thank our partners for participating in the panel today. Jessica, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you, District Attorney Katz, for those words, for that introduction, and for hosting this event and bringing this incredible group together today. Um, as District Attorney Katz already mentioned, the purpose of this event is to increase awareness 
and the identification and the reporting of trafficking to make sure we're bringing those who are trafficked and exploited to safety, as well as prosecuting those who exploit them. And also as not supporting commercial enterprises who are operating through exploitation. Human trafficking is a crime that's motivated by financial gain. And because of that, traffickers rarely have only one victim. Therefore, an essential, essential element in combating trafficking is to hold traffickers accountable, in our opinion. And our office does this by placing equal and primary importance, as District Attorney Katz noted, on doing so in a victim-centered and trauma-informed way that is also culturally competent to help those who experience trafficking escape and give them the tools to reduce the vulnerabilities so that they're not trafficked again. Um, and that we minimize the trauma that they're sustaining by reporting and seeking help. I just want to also thank, um, he is not on the panel, but he is here for questions at the end of the presentation, if any of the attendees have any. We also have um, Detective Liam O'Hara from the Citywide Human Trafficking Team with the NYPD, who we routinely work closely with. First, before we get into our, these incredible presentations, I just want to start, start, the pre, start this webinar by defining trafficking, because there's unfortunately a lot of misconceptions about human trafficking, both sex and labor trafficking, have helped misinformation about these crimes spread rapidly through communities and through social media. Um, and when we do hear about human trafficking, we usually hear about sex trafficking when we hear it reported. But there's another type of trafficking that we don't talk about as much as a community, and that's labor trafficking. And that, that labor trafficking affects an even wider range of individuals. While the prevalence of trafficking is very difficult to measure since these crimes are so far underreported, it's estimated, um, and I know some of our experts will, will talk about some of those numbers in their presentations, that um, it's labor trafficking is even more pre prevalent in the United States than sex trafficking, but it's not as reported as frequently and not enough resources are being allotted to identify and investigate, investigate it. And that's why we invited you here today, because it's only no, what we know what to look for that we can try to identify it and get help. There's a saying that says we see what we know. So hopefully today we're going to give you the tools to look in your own communities and your work to identify when labor trafficking may be, may be occurring. Um, and you know, labor trafficking is a crime that unfortunately happens in plain sight and often in seemingly legitimate businesses and services. You know, and just talking about some of the myths involved tra involving trafficking, trafficking is a legal term and ADA Kieran Chima is going to define that law to you today and tell you what to look for. But I just wanna dispel a few misconceptions about trafficking before we get started. Most people think of trafficking. Um, we think about the way it's reported in the media, the way it's in our movies. We think about movement. We think about somebody brought, being brought from one country to another country or one state to another state. Um, but in reality, there's no element of transportation or travel that's required to prove trafficking under our law in New York State. Trafficking can take place without ever leaving a state without ever leaving a city, a county, a zip code, or even a building or a home. Someone can be trafficked without being moved. Oftentimes people also tend to think about trafficking as something that's violent, um, that it always takes the force of injury and violence. But the most common type of tools traffickers use to take advantage and exploit people is, is intense forms of psychological manipulation and fear and control. Um, that could be fear of immigration consequences, fear of arrest, imprisonment, or fear of injury to their family members. There's so many different forms of labor trafficking, but the common thread running through all of them is that they prey upon the most vulnerable members of our community. They prey upon those who face discrimination or are marginalized, and many of who are foreign born. I can tell you from personal experience that the cases we've prosecuted in Queens have involved horrific deprivations of human liberty. And we've seen not only adults um, be affected by these crimes, but also children um, being trafficked in homes and, and in businesses, um, and are oftentimes even forced to commit crimes during the course of their trafficking. Um, and almost all of the labor trafficking cases we have been seeing involve foreign born 
um, victims, almost all of whom did not self-identify as being trafficked at the time of their exploitation. So now I want to introduce you to ADA Kieran Chima, who prepared a PowerPoint to define New York State's law on labor trafficking. Assistant District Attorney Kieran Chima was born and raised in Flushing, Queens. She began her service at Queens District Attorney's Office in 2014 as an intern in the Domestic Violence Bureau. And she became an assistant district attorney here in 2015, where she served in the criminal court and intake bureaus. Since 2016, she's worked on human trafficking investigations and pro prosecutions. And most notably, in 2019, um, in our last trafficking trial before the pandemic, um, she tried a case um, then obtained a jury trial conviction against a defendant for trafficking a 16-year-old teenage child who was a product of our foster care system. That defendant was sentenced to 20 years in prison after trial. In 2020, she was selected by District Attorney Melinda Katz to serve as an assistant district attorney in the newly formed Human Trafficking Bureau. And she's been dedicated to combating those individuals who target and victimize others who are often young, vulnerable, marginalized, have little social and economic support systems. She also is on the District Attorney's Hiring Partners Committee, and she was acknowledged for her work by District Attorney Katz in 2021 as an honoree at the Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Celebration hosted by the Queen's District Attorney's Office. Um, Kieran, would you please begin your presentation? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Jessica. Let me share my screen. How's that? Thank you so much for that introduction. I also want to thank everyone for um, joining us here today. And I'm excited to be a part of this panel. And I'm here to give you a brief overview of the law. Um, as we do more of these events, our community awareness grows about human trafficking. And I want to remind everyone here that when I speak of labor trafficking, I'm using a legal term that has a very specific meaning. There is a law um, against labor trafficking um, in New York, and that's New York Penal Law Section 135.35, which is a Class D felony. And notably, it's in the same article of the penal law as unlawful imprisonment, kidnapping, and coercion, which makes sense because certainly these crimes can go hand in hand with labor trafficking. So what exactly is the law against labor trafficking? What must a person do in order to be found guilty of committing this crime? Uh, as it turns out, there are a number of ways that a person can commit the crime of labor trafficking. A person is guilty of labor trafficking if he or she compels or induces another to engage in labor or recruits, entices, harbors, or transports such other person by means of intentionally, one, requiring that the labor be performed to retire, repay, or service a real or purported debt that the act has caused by a systematic ongoing course of conduct with intent to defraud such person, two, withholding, destroying, or confiscating any actual or purported passport, immigration document, or any other actual or purported government identification document of another person with intent to impair said person's freedom of movement, or three, using force or engaging in any scheme, plan, or pattern to compel or induce such person to engage in or continue to engage in labor activity by means of instilling a fear in such a person that if the demand is not complied with, the actor or another will do one or more of the following. And you'll notice that there are paragraphs A through G, which I will discuss. Um, for this third subsection here, you'll notice that the words instilling a fear are highlighted. And this is something really important that I wanted to emphasize, that traffickers do not necessarily have to engage in physical violence or any of the factors that I'm about to read to you. They certainly can, but they can also simply instill a fear that they will do so 
and that is enough to charge them with the crime of labor trafficking. So let's put this all together. A person is guilty of labor trafficking if he or she compels or induces another to engage in labor or recruits, entices, harbors, or transports such other person by means of intentionally using force or engaging in any scheme, plan, or pattern to compel or induce such person to engage in or continue to engage in labor activity by means of instilling a fear in such a person that if the demand is not complied with, the actor or another will, A, cause physical injury, serious physical injury, or death to a person. Again, what this means is that if someone compels or induces another person to engage in labor activity by means of instilling a fear of causing physical injury to a person, they could be charged with the crime of labor trafficking. And if you remember, we had sections A through G. So what else can a labor trafficker compel or induce someone with a fear of? A trafficker can instill a fear that if someone does not engage in labor activity, they will cause damage to property. A trafficker can instill a fear that if someone does not engage in labor activity, they will commit another felony or commit the crime of unlawful imprisonment. A trafficker can instill a fear that if someone does not engage in labor activity, the trafficker will bring criminal charges or deportation proceedings against them. And I cannot emphasize this one enough. It is against the law to do this. And I know that some of our panelists will speak more about this, but we can all see how traffickers can, ex can prey upon and exploit our immigrant community and how this subsection of the law um, attempts to combat that. A trafficker can instill a fear that if someone does not engage in labor activity, the trafficker will expose a secret about them or publicize an asserted fact. Some examples that come to mind are publicizing a person's sexual orientation or publicizing a secret recording of a person. A trafficker can instill a fear that if someone does not engage in labor activity, the trafficker will testify against them in court or withhold evidence. And finally, a trafficker can instill a fear that if someone does not engage in labor activity, that he or she will abuse his or her position as a public servant. Anyone can commit labor trafficking, including people in positions of power. So this section about public officials just reinforces that. So this is the law against labor trafficking. Um, I hope that this has been informative. If anyone has any questions about this, please feel free to reach out to the district attorneys Human Trafficking Bureau. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kieran, for that description. Um, next on our panel, I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Coraline Griffith Hunt. She's a New York State Senate woman of distinction. And I can tell you um, just my, my interactions with her, she's a woman of action as well. Um, when we were planning this, um, I've seen, I've seen Dr. Um, Griffith Hunt's presentations before and was really floored by them. Um, and I can tell you when we were preparing this in the early stages of this presentation, Dr. Hunt, um, I believe the universe willed her to participate with us today because as we were planning, she called and wanted to collaborate on a project. And this is such, this is I'm sure only one of many um, projects we will work on in the future. Dr. Coraline Griffith Hunt is a human industrial trauma psychologist. So she's going to give us a unique um, description of trafficking and the behavior of traffic people who've experienced trafficking based on what this does psychologically to a person who's been um, exploited. She's the founder and chairwoman of the Created for Greatness Leadership Group, Inc., a, human, a humanitarian consulting training and developmental organization. Dr. Griffith Hunt has been recognized for her unique ability to establish authentic partnerships, resulting in the building of better lives, businesses, and communities within the United States and abroad. Through implementing research-based modeling in leadership and intervention, trauma-informed care, education, community, and family engagement. Dr. Griffin Hunt currently travels across the globe conducting a range 
um, of engaging evidence-based trainings and developmental programs. Dr. Griffith Hunt is also a professor at Mercy College and a senior training and development facilitator for the Research Foundation of the City of New York. In addition, Dr. Griffith Hunt is a senior legislative advisor who works on a daily basis with key government officials and other organizations at the state, local, and federal level to pass legislation favorable to the educational, human rights, mental health, anti-domestic violence, anti-human anti trafficking, anti-gang, community engagement and empowerment mission for New York State families. In 2021, Dr. Griffith Hunt was chosen to represent the United States of America and spoke in Switzerland at the Geneva Center for Human Rights Advancement and Global Dialogue. In addition, Dr. Griffith Hunt was selected to serve on the Queensboro President's Veterans Elderly and Mental Health Committee. In 2020, Dr. Griffith Hunt joined the United Nations 58th Commission for Social Development and Homelessness Around the World. With collaborative efforts, Dr. Griffith Hunt has assisted in developing the UN's resolution on homelessness. Dr. Griffith Hunt was instrumental in advocating for the End Child Sex Trafficking Bill, which was signed into legislation in 2018. And we thank her for that because that is a huge tool we use in combating trafficking in Queens. Dr. Griffin Hunt is a proud member of the American Psych Psychology Association, the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress, and the National Center for Crisis Management. She is also the first trauma psychologist to serve on the New York Recovery Community Coalition and has served as a member of Senator James Sanders' Economic and Marketing Committee. In 2010, she was elected to govern over 60 schools and was the advisor to the mayor and chancellor of the city of New York. In addition, she was appointed as an educational community representative for the president of the Borough of Queens for the late Honorable Helen Marshall. Dr. Griffith Hunt's collaborative efforts with various professionals within the local, state, and federal government, the police department, clergy members, community boards, health service professionals, and financial institutions allows her to organize and execute organizational community and school district programs, initiatives, and events with the purpose of exposing, um, of exposing stakeholders to strategies and resources available to them. And we, forgive me for abbreviating your bio, Dr. Hunt, but I do not wanna take one more minute away from the expertise that you're going to give to the entire panel, including myself, um, Dr. Hunt's accomplishments are incredible and wide reaching and we thank her for being here and sharing this unique area of expertise with us today. Thank you so very much, Jessica and everyone else that, that's on the panel. I appreciate you all and I, I'm honored to be amongst you. I, I really am because we all bring such a wealth of information and knowledge and expertise to the table. And so I'm honored to be a part of this and, and I'm honored that the um, Queens District Attorney, you know, would even acknowledge that we don't talk enough about um, labor trafficking and, and to have this courageous conversation. I, I, I thank you all so much. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. And okay, can you see it? Okay, so we can see it. We also see the slides lined up on the side. So we, we, we okay. do see the slides. What is going on here? How's that? Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. So I have been tasked with the wonderful um, job of, of sharing what is so necessary as it relates to the psychological aspect of what an individual or individuals go through that are labor traffic. Why? Because it matters. I think a lot of times we tend to want to see a, a um, you know, we look at it from a one size fits all 
point of view as it relates to um, how individuals who have been trafficked, how they respond to, I'm having issues here, forgive me. Okay, how individuals respond to when we question them, when we as, you know, whether we are clinicians, whether we are district attorneys, um, police officers, family members, even our clergy. We want individuals that have experienced labor trafficking to just tell us the story um, in a chronological form, and that, that's impossible. I want you to know that. And in addition, we want them to get over it. That's another thing. We want this instantaneously. Well, okay, you're not a part of, you know, that labor trafficking situation anymore. So, you know, how long are you going to keep dwelling in the space that you are in? And so today what I want to, to enlighten us on is really understanding how traumatic this is for them. The key to understanding trauma is finding out how the body and, and how the human brain responds to helplessness and how the helplessness engages our natural instinct of survival. So I want you to think for a second, have you ever had a paper cut? I know I have, right? So let's say you got a paper cut on Saturday. Today is Tuesday. So by now you would have forgotten all about the fact that you had a paper cut. Why? The reason why is because the body was created to self-heal. And so without you having to do anything major, the, the messages throughout your bodies and the cells, the neurons, everything, we know that our body said, hey, there's an intruder, there's a paper cut, go heal that area. And so that area was healed. Now that was external. And that's why I shared with you the concept of a paper cut, because that's an external intruder. That's something that happened on the external. But what happens when it's internal? You see, trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is what happens inside of you as a result of what has happened to you. So when I say that your brain is involved, I want you to know that your kidneys, your heart, your liver, there's not a part of you that have not experienced trauma. That trauma, once you have, been involved in any type of traumatic event, situation, or circumstance. An event circumstance becomes traumatic because it overwhelms the brain's capacity to cope. It's very important because this is what's going to help you to understand why an individual just doesn't get over it. It helps you to understand why trauma bonding takes place. It will help you to understand why someone could experience trauma at age six and at age 50, they're still going through that traumatic event over and over. There's no one size fits all. There's no quick fix to this. In all trafficking situations, complex trauma occurs and affects the body on every level. It removes the ability to self-regulate. And once this occurs, the victim's cognitive perception is dismantled. That's very important. I want you to, to really pay attention because it's going to teach you why they aren't able to once again tell us their story from A to Z. Instead, sometimes they may share their story with us, A, B, Q, R, P, T, and we're going, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Maybe they're, they're lying about their story because they can't tell us their story in a chronological manner. But remember, the cognitive perception has been dismantled. Every time abuse takes place, and this abuse is physically, verbally, emotionally, spiritually, and yes, there are cases where an individual that's a part of labor trafficking is also a part of sex trafficking. Is that interconnection there? It's a stressor and the hormone cortisol is not only released, but elevated. So I want you to think of that person's brain actually taking a bath in stress and the stress hormone. So we can see 
the need for them to, to want to have ease because our body is created to receive pleasure. We want pleasure all the time. And that pleasure hormone is dopamine. The body cho will choose dopamine anytime over stress. But this is what happens. So the individual that has been uh, um, involved in labor trafficking because they don't want to be in stress, but they want to be in pleasure, they will do whatever the perpetrator tells them to do. Why? Because the body is seeking to be at peace. The body's seeking to be in pleasure. And when I say the body, I'm speaking mainly about the brain because the brain is remember soaking in stress. And it's not a good stress like the nervousness of the first day of school or the nervousness of the, you know, you just got hired and you're starting a new day or the nervousness of even getting married. No, this stress is a stress that is it's causing the body to be in pain. And so they do whatever it takes. I wanted you to really look at what an unstressed brain looks like. Do you see that the prefrontal cortex, that individual that's not experiencing that negative stress has tight control of their thoughts, their emotions and their actions. But an individual that is, whose brain is soaking in that stress, that um, prefrontal cortex, what is happening? We could control of thoughts. This is why when they share their stories with us, they may miss out information. We could control of our thoughts, their emotions and their actions. The prefrontal cortex, which is the CEO of the brain, which helps us to regulate, you know, plan, make decisions and so forth. Could you imagine that part of your brain shutting down on you? Because that's what happens to individuals that's going through that type of, of labor trafficking. Their, their prefrontal cortex has shut down and it allows the doing part of the brain to act. And so this is why when they get triggered or activated, they get right into fight, flight, freeze, or, fawn, or the fawn mood. Now, I want us to think about the children because I want you to know that across our globe, there are millions of children that are involved in labor trafficking. It is happening. I want you to look at the normal healthy brain for a developmental, a child that's developing. Do you see how active it is? You see where all of those parts where it's red, the prefrontal cortex is forming and so forth. Now I want you to look at the brain that's involved in toxic stress. Do you see the deficiencies? This is what's happening to our children. And, and a child who experiences grows up in, and if they're still a part of that labor trafficking, those deficiencies are still there. And, and what we have also been seeing is the traumatic brain injury, TBI. Because a lot of times, and, and though we talk about just the verbal abuse, individuals that are a part of labor trafficking are physically abused as well. And and majority of the times they're hit in the head. They are their heads are mushed to, into walls and cabinets. Um, they're punched in the head. And do you see what's happening? The healthy brain we can see the concentration, the sense of touch, healthy vision, memory, organization, balance. Now I want you to look at an individual who have experienced any form of TBI. Lack of focus, difficulty with reading, blind spots, problems with short and long-term memory, difficulty walking, their speech can be slurred, changes in their breath. And I want you to know that when, when those individuals are experiencing that, they tend to have their upper extremities are very hyperactive and their lower extremities are hyperactive. And so those individuals have a lot, they deal a lot with constipation. They deal a lot with depression. They deal a lot with IBS. So there's, there's so much going on, not just in the brain, but in their physical bodies, in their organs. And so by the time they get to myself, that's a clinician, I have to look not only at the psychological um, aspect of this individual, 
but also the physical aspect because trauma affects both the psychological and the physical. So, you know, and, and I know that you all mentioned, you know, beforehand about the coercion where that trauma bonding can happen because once again, that brain is seeking out for pleasure. So they'll do whatever it takes. A victim may eventually feel helpless and respond to any form of help. So you'll say to yourself, well, how could they, you know, have some type of bond with the person who's, you know, doing such harm to them? because the brain is seeking any form of kindness, any form of help. And that bond is created because then you'll hear, you know, um, that that person say to them, the perpetrator will say, if you're loyal to me, you know, look at what I did. If you stayed in your country, you wouldn't have this food and I'm providing you with food. So that's the reward if I just, you know what, if I just listen to him or her, you know, I'll be able to eat. If I just, if I just do what they say, I'll make things so much easier. So now they internalize it and, if, and, and, and blame themselves if they get hit, if they are mistreated, they'll internalize and blame themselves. Why? Because if I would just listen, if I would just do what they say, they'll treat me kind. So it's really me that's the problem. But what happens with this coercion? How does that really play a, a, a role? Isolation. Isolation threats, and we mentioned that. They don't have their papers. The, per, the perpetrator has their papers. They don't know their social security numbers. They, they, and some of them who were brought here illegally, they're afraid that they will be deported. And that perpetrator is telling them, oh, they're gonna just deport you, the things that they're gonna do to you, they're gonna mistreat you. I, I treat you better than anyone else will treat you. All of this and what's happening to the brain. Have you ever had a computer or a laptop that just moves slowly? And you realize, you know what? I have too many tabs open. Well, that person's brain has too many tabs open. There's so much that they're feeling. You see, because trauma can be a speechless terror, full of intense fear or helplessness. Trauma is remembered less in words and more in our feelings and our bodies. Trauma causes a feeling of paranoia and depression. In fact, individuals who have experienced labor trafficking have a higher level of depression than an individual who have been sex trafficked because they're, they're, they're thinking constantly. There's an identity confusion suicidal and homicidal ideations, distortion. And, and the truth of the matter is the tragedy is the loneliness, the inability to convey the inner experience and knowing that they cannot get it out without repeating their story. And that brain, when it has to constantly, when the individual has to constantly repeat their story, the brain is registering that that labor trafficking situation is happening the, the very moment they're telling it to you. So if it only happened 10 times, the brain is registering. If it happened 10 times, but they've told their story 100 times, the brain registers that that trafficking um, situation happened 100 times. So I want us to move away from thinking that it's a quick fix, thinking that you know, um, we don't have to be trauma informed. We have to be trauma informed, but we cannot be trauma informed without being culturally informed. And I'll end with saying this, a lot of individuals that I have come into contact with, labor trafficking was a part of their culture. It was just not named labor trafficking. It was the way of life. And so, you have to know, you don't have to agree to understand. You have to understand how this affects the person in a, a holistic form. Just because something is cultural does not make it right. And if we're not trauma informed, we will repeat what we don't repair. So it's for those of us who are on this panel and those who are watching to really become trauma informed because this is happening not just around the world. I'm a far rock girl, I'm a Queens girl. It's happening right in our borough. 
And the more informed we are, the better we can be to help our fellow citizens. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunt, for that description. And it reminds me of a case, it was a sex trafficking case we tried years ago. And the, the victim in that case was given like one reward to go out to a club if she earned enough money. And of course the trafficker was there with the camera to take the pictures of her, you know, with the Hennessy bottle, her dancing in the club videos. And I said, you know, we're, we're trial now, we're gonna have to explain to the jury because this is something people don't understand understand as common knowledge. Why? And I remember she said to me, she said, Miss Jessica, you don't understand when you're living in hell, you'll do whatever you can just to feel good for a moment. And thank you so much, Dr. Hunt, for your outreach in this area, because it's we really as a community as need to get more informed. And, you know, a lot of people are ignorant as to this effect on people. And we'd be like, why didn't he or she leave? And, uh, so thank you so much. Um, next, I am extremely honored to introduce this passionate panelist, um, Fameda Masale. Um, Fameda, um, I can't even tell you how happy I am she's here and she's sharing her story with us. She is a powerful advocate. Um, she is an educator. Uh, but today she's also speaking from a very unique perspective as someone who has themselves experienced labor trafficking, um, which is a very difficult thing to talk about as Dr. Hunt um, explained to us. I wanna thank her very much. She has her bachelor's degree from your college. Um, she has her master's degree in special education, supervision of schools and buildings from Toro College. Her professional career, she's a teacher, humanitarian, human rights, and motivational speaker. Um, in terms of her adv uh, advocacy work, and I could tell you just in the short time I've known Ms. Mosley, she's an advocate um, to the core. Um, she is a survivor of trafficking and her passion is to ensure that as many people possible are given the tools to recognize the signs of human trafficking, the plight of labor trafficking and domestic violence, and in order to ascend from a life of oppression and gain economic and person personal freedom away from trafficking life. Fumetta Masale is an educator working for the New York City Department of Education for over 25 years. That alone deserves a standing ovation. Um, serving as Brooklyn Borough Director and Queens Vice Chair for Not On My Watch in Tandem. Um, the partnership um, has facilitated awareness throughout the five boroughs of New York City amongst its citizens regarding the way in which individuals can fall prey to human trafficking and domestic violence. Um, Ms. Masale partners with houses of worship, community organizations, hospitals, domestically and abroad, spreading awareness of the prevalence of human trafficking, which often leads to domestic violence. Ms. Masale has also participated in, participated in lobbying for the pass, uh, passing of legislation to reduce online sites such as Craigslist and Backpage from promoting and posting advertisements of human beings for sale. Um, it is an honor to introduce um, Ms. Masale um, today for your... Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanna say, first of all, being honored is is beyond. Um, I'm a little under the weather, putting it mildly. So if you see me sweating, it's because of, I'm a little hot. Um, I'm hot to be in your presence too. Um, I wanna thank the district attorney, um, Ms. Katz, for having the vision to, to galvanize such amazing team of strong legal minds, as well as people who are passionate about doing the right thing, not just because it's their job, but because as human beings, if we don't take care of each other, we will cease to exist. Um, with that said, I would like to um, also thank Ms. Melton, who just, um, Fameda, you froze for a minute. Yes, I think we, we lost her for one minute. Okay.
she's coming back on now. She just got kicked off for a moment. Do we want to do some Q&A while we wait? Sure. Okay, I see a question. Oh, is she now back? I see questions from Reverend Carlene Thorpe McGee. Um, how do we know what we're looking at and how do we identify? Um, I know I know some of our other panelists are going to talk about some of those um, red flags and warning signs. Is there anybody on the panel that wants to add um, anything to that question? If not, I'll, I'll be happy to start. I mean, I know I tend to look at, um, especially with respect to labor trafficking, if someone's living with their employer or being transported to and from work by their employer, that's definitely a red flag that trafficking could be occurring. Um, anybody that's not in possession of their identification, um, that is a huge red flag. If your employer tells you uh, or a person, I'll hold your passport so you don't lose it, um, that is a, a big red flag someone's being trafficked. Um, and, um, that any any type of physical any type of physical altercations through um, employers and employees is a huge red flag of um, trafficking. Is there any other red flags, people? Um, any other panelists would like to bring up? Jessica, um, yeah, this is Estelle. Um, I know Estelle's got this on. <laughs> that that's her part of piece of the puzzle. So mm -hmm. um, go ahead. You want to throw a few more out there? Or oh, sure. I was just going to say you covered the primarily ones. I was going to say, okay. um, and this was brought up earlier, but I think um, the most common thing that I see are threats on the basis of immigration status. Mm -hmm. So threats to um, call the police and have somebody deported. You know, and those threats can be implied. We have instances where the employer will say, you know what will happen, or you know mm -hmm. what happened to X person. Okay. And the individual understands that that's what that means. Yes, thank you so much. I see Ms. Um, Fometa is back online. They... You're muted, Fometa. I, I don't know. My computer was fully charged. I, I guess that's um, the, the negative energy in the universe that was taken over. And again, I wanna say thank you for having me here. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience um, of, of what it was like and what it is like working with people um, who are labor trafficked. So we can begin the slides. Thank you, um, Anna. So from my perspective, Freedom stolen, the price of seeing snow. When I was eight years old, um, my mother, I lived in West Africa, Liberia, and my mother was a teacher. Irony, I'm a teacher. Um, I swore never to become a teacher and everything led me back there. My mother worked for a woman who was pretty wealthy and financially secure and had reach in many parts of the country as well as family and resources here in America. She convinced my mother that it would be a great idea to send her energetic but well-behaved daughter to live in America. And, and the law was I would gain a free education. I would become financially independent to come back home and help the family. Many of you may not know this, and some of you may, maybe all of you know. But in countries outside of America that are economically insecure or impoverished, the children are the retirement system of the parents. So me gaining um, social, financial ascension and mobility was a great idea. My mother, like I said, was a teacher in a um, nursery school and my father was a police officer. Here in America, that would be seen as a, a pretty decent living, right? family should be able to maintain, not there. Because again, Liberia had sustained many economic on upside down turns. So when I was encountered by this woman and she met me, she interviewed me, 
She, the grooming process began. I didn't know I was being groomed. She convinced my mother to train me to change my name and my age. My name was changed to Musu Dardi. I was born for Meta Tiny Wee Masale. I had to learn a new name and my age went up two years. I went from eight to 10. And as if, if to say that was not sufficient, I was convinced that I was going to see snow and come right back. That was the highlight of it. I wanted to see snow. Snow was amazing. I don't know if you can do a flashback back to when you were seven, six, or eight. Think about that fantasy you had that you wanted and your parents were about to give it to you. I was so happy. I, I would have called myself Corella DeVille. I, I didn't know who she was at the time, but I would have. That was the turning point for me. I came to America accompanied by a woman I didn't know. She pretended to be my aunt on the plane. We came, we arrived at JFK, we made it through customs, and then she deposited me with some strangers. That turning point went from me being shuffled from home to home, cooking, cleaning, doing laundry, all the domestic things that a parent or other people in the house may share as chores became all of my duties. Um, as if to say that was not enough again, I was constantly ridiculed, regularly beaten, um, deprived of food. It took many years, but finally the, um, I think someone had gotten some kind of social service or someone came to the home and out of fear of reprisal from law enforcement, I was placed in school. I knew not to run away because I had been convinced that if um, I did that, the police were going to put me in jail and they were going to send me back to Liberia. And at that point, I had been convinced that my parents were gone. They didn't want me. Um, and, and the isolation that Dr. Hunt talked about was extremely prevalent in my life. I knew not to make friends. I knew not to come home and talk about the kids that were beating me up on a daily basis. I knew that the coercion and tactics of my traffickers were extremely consistent. It was a daily occurrence. Food deprivation was a regular occurrence as well. Um, when I became um, what they call disrespectful, say I didn't do something fast enough, I didn't cook something to the perfection of who tasted it, I, I would be beat, forced to sleep in the bathtub. Um, and the physical traumas that also happened was um, during that time, I became a, a serious bedwetter. And um, it, it was really bad. I could not, it, it was almost incontinent. So I got beat for that as well. And that did not end. Then um, the worst thing that could happen, I was raped by someone that lived in one of the buildings I lived in and I became pregnant. And I was accused of being a prostitute. And that's why I was raped. None of that, of course, was the truth. It was very far from the truth. So when my daughter was born, in Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, the social worker recognized that somehow things were not right. Um, she asked me for my papers. I told her that I didn't have any papers and I told her I was older than what I was. And somehow she convinced me to, to leave. She was extremely resourceful and she was able to really tap into what I knew that I did not want my child to be a to fall prey or to fall target to what had happened and I don't like to use the word victims of, of labor trafficking of victims of trafficking we are people that are targeted I was targeted purposely my family was tricked by statements of manipulation threats of exposure was given to me 
by law enforcement agencies. The economic trappings for me was I didn't have a job. They had my papers. They wouldn't give them back to me. I'd seen them. And when I went back to the place where I found them, they were gone. It's as if to say someone knew I discovered them. Um, I was not paid for any of the work I did. I, I would hear um, one of my traffickers, she would say to anyone, oh, she will do it. I'll bring her over. She'll clean your house. What do you need? Hours and hours of work. And no matter how tired I was, no matter how many hours I had spent doing whatever, it wasn't sufficient. And limiting my ability to form bonds, I could not have friends. I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone. If anyone spoke to me for any reason, I would get hit. If we were walking down the street and someone called my name, how do you know them? What did you tell them? It was, it, this was constant. Um, so this is something that other labor targets are experiencing. And this prevents them from reaching out to you guys, to the district attorney office, to calling law enforcement officers. And what I would like for us to do out of this panel is to shine a light on labor trafficking and show exactly how deprivating this is, how oppressive it is by educating the general public as often as possible, such as we're doing right now, about the potential methods that are used by, our, by these traffickers, informing individuals, whether in our immediate family or on a broad scale, such as a professional panel like this, how easy it is to manip manipulate, coerce, and oppress someone who is economically insecure, who is, is fearful of political reprisal if they return to their, their native country, right? We need to educate medical and health staff. We need to go into the municipal um, um, sectors, sanitation, um, traffic agents. These are people that see things. Their lens are different than our lens. We may have more of a professional lens to see this, but they may not be able to recognize it and identify it to report it. So that that is our task, right? To educate that broader, spectrum of New York City to make sure that we are galvanized and we are the warriors on the ground at all corners. Um, so once we shine the light on this, we need to also remember that constantly we need to re-educate ourselves of the new tactics because traffickers are very savvy. They're extreme. They could be the best CEO. They could be um, Elon Musk because they're constantly re reinventing their approaches and how they, they attempt to lure people, such as myself and others, whether it's in the restaurant business, whether it's in the domestic um, industry, hotels, it could be in a senator's kitchen. I'm not putting it out there on any senators that's on the line. I'm just saying it could happen that easily. You may not know, maybe your wife hired the person you didn't know, okay. So in order for us to make sure that we get this message across of sounding the alarm, each of us need to stand strong and firm and know that this exploitation is not isolated. It is by design. And there are very powerful people that are designing it and wielding it. And labor trafficking comes with a price, right? The traumatic flashbacks due to adverse childhood experiences will constantly happen. Do I experience? I still do. So I have put together my own team, therapists, um, professional people, um, different approaches that I use and I implore to make sure that I'm on my A game and my reoccurring issues don't bring me away from helping someone in front of me. Fear of expulsion, immigration, reporting is always going to be a method that is used. So if you approach someone, you, you out at a restaurant with your friends and family, and you see what you think may be what you're seeing, which is someone that is being um, inappropriately treated, disenfranchised, your approach needs to be very selective and very careful because that person may be in a, in able to, to make eye contact with you, in able to trust you. Because 
they're afraid. And in this world of cyber technology, there's cameras everywhere, right? In the restaurant, in the lobby of the hotel, at the house where you see your neighbor and you know something's wrong. So these are the signs we need to look for. Consistent fear of exposure is what that person's going through. So the approach needs to be subtle and consistent. And if, if you, you don't recognize that that person is willing at that time that you approach them to engage what you're offering, then it's time for you to be careful for yourself, seek safety, and contact a professional that can help you. Um, the fear of loss of wages and shaming is, is, is serious, right? It's ongoing. Um, Anna, you can hit the next slide. Thank you. So we're going to sound the alarm today because our goal is to bring freedom of isolation from these individuals, freedom of societal oppression and shaming, whether they're afraid to go back to their home country for failure or just shaming for, for going through what they're going through. Because oftentimes labor trafficking intersects or overlaps with sexual abuse and exploitation. So I posted, um, my slides can be shared at the end. Um, when you recognize this or you have thoughts that someone you know or have witnessed is going through a form of labor trafficking, please do not hesitate to call law enforcement and, or contact the National Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888. And I wanna thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to impart this information of my experience and experience that many people right here, the restaurant you go to, the deli you buy your lunch, the place you take your son and daughter to play, they're experiencing this and it's real. It's oppressive, it's physically debilitating, and it causes all of those physical conditions that Dr. Hunt shared and talked about. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Fometa. That was incredible. And it's important for all of us doing our jobs um, in combating trafficking to really hear our survivors' perspectives to help us improve our response. Because uh, as you said, the traffickers are improving their responses and we have to keep up with them. So I understand how difficult it is to speak to large groups of people about these experiences. And I just want to thank you so much and ask you one quick question that I know came up when you shared with me during one of our talks. Um, when you were in your trafficking situation, did you know you were being trafficked at the time? That is a very good question. I did not know. Um, remember, um, culturally, I came from another glo uh, another continent. I had no experience with, with any of this. I didn't know what child abuse was or anything. And I did not know I was being trapped, that I had been trafficked until many, many years later after I came out of foster care. I did not know. I knew I had been abused. I recognized it that I was being treated um, not well, to put it mildly, but the traffic aspect of it, I began to understand what trafficking was when I started attending college. I came across articles and I said, oh, wait a minute, this maybe this is what happened to me. But oftentimes, um, people that are suffering under this targeting do not know that this is what's happening to them. They just know they're not getting paid, they know they're working a lot of hours, their, their boss, oppressor, trafficker, is not being fair. That's that's how, from our perspective, that's what Thank we see. You. Thank you, Fometa. And I, I think that was really important to bring up the sections of trying to identify intercepts and off ramps where in our institutions can, may be coming into contact with trafficking survivors. So we as a community can do a better job of identifying it if the person in the situation um, is unaware. So thank you so much. I'm sure we're going to work together on more projects in the future. Um, but thank you so much. And please stay on because we may have some more questions um, before the end. Next, I'm excited excited to introduce Tori Cubello, the Director of Education, Training, and Advocacy at LifeWay Network, to talk about 
um, just the prevalence of trafficking and some statistics on this. Um, Tori and I, in the last few years, have ended up just not even organizing things together, but ended up being selected together to serve on um, some outside speaking engagements. And every time I hear Tori Cabello speak, I learn something new. Um, so I thank you so much for being here. Um, she's responsible for advancing LifeWays Network's educational uh, and advocacy initiatives drawn to LifeWays commitment to serving human trafficking survivors. Tori's career has focused on combating exploitation and similar human rights abuses. She carries experience from UNICEF USA, Fair Trade USA, and the in International Rescue Committee and WIN. Tori enjoys connecting with individuals around the urgency of human trafficking as engaged in audiences everywhere from the United Nations to Times Square. In 2015, she launched UNICEF's USA's podcast, Ending Human Trafficking Locally and Globally. She holds a master's degree in public health from the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health um, and Health Policy and a Bachelor in Arts and Political Science um, and Italian from the College of Holy Cross and is pursuing a second master's degree in international affairs at Columbia University. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, Tori. Thank you. And when you mentioned the question about the red flags, I'm just looking behind me because I have a whole banister here of red flags. So I definitely recommend if you're not familiar with the red flags, um, organizations like Lifeway and probably many on the panel today have one pagers that I recommend looking at periodically just to refresh your heads a bit. So I'm going to share my screen to give you a bit of a visual of what I'm talking about to follow along. Um, Hope you can see that. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so as mentioned, I'm Tori Curbello. I work at Lifeway Network. And in addition to providing education to the public, we provide long-term safe housing for women survivors above the age of 18. And I just wanna thank quickly the Queen's DA's office for having us here today. And it's just a pleasure to be with all of these outstanding panelists. Um, I was just ecstatic to be on this panel specifically because it focused on labor trafficking. I think it's an issue that we can all get behind because it's not like some of the other uh, topics out there where we can blame a foreign dictator or a different country for the problem, but it's something that is so connected with our global economy that it does force us to look inward. And instead of being discouraged, we can try to take action against it. So, with that, I wanted to give some statistics just to address the scope of the issue and what uh, we're talking about. Um, do keep in mind that these statistics are guesstimates and they're not precise. So these are the best that we have so far, but again, take it with a grain of salt. So it is estimated that around the world there are about 40.3 million victims of modern slavery worldwide. And I'll explain what that means in a second, but that's a pretty big number if you consider that the scope of New York the population is about 8 million. So it's about five times that number. And in that comprises forced marriage, state imposed trafficking, forced sexual exploitation, and private sector. And private sector just means labor trafficking. And that comes in at about 40%. So it's actually the most common type of uh, modern slavery out there, which goes against what we think when we think about trafficking, such as like sex trafficking. So it's actually the most pervasive type. Now, these statistics will change if you're talking about a specific country or you're talking about a specific community. Um, for instance, the reports that we have, sometimes it seems that sex trafficking is more common in certain places in the US, but again, these are reports and it does have to do with what tends to get reported rather than what exists. So do keep that in mind. Um, some of our best statistics come from the human trafficking hotline. Uh, although there's others that report data, it's not very consistent uh, because you have organizations that are based out of different states, they collect different types of information, so it's hard to say on a national basis what's the case because you can't compare one thing to the other if it's not, um, if it's not similar enough. But the Human Trafficking Hotline is a great place to start because they have uh, reports from all 50 states. 
So as you can see here, uh, in I believe this is 2019, they had about uh, over 22,000 survivors identified and about 4,934 were labor trafficking and then 1,048 were sex and labor trafficking. Uh, in the state of New York, so there were about 454 trafficking cases in New York, 52 cases of labor trafficking, and then 23 cases of uh, sex and labor trafficking. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we believe labor trafficking exists. I believe in the Q&A, someone had asked what are some of the causes of labor trafficking? I believe some of the top reasons in my head at least are one that it's a high profit, low risk industry, meaning that there is a lot of money to be made on exploiting folks for labor and very little risk involved. The laws have not caught up as they should to protecting people to the best of um, the government's ability. And so in a sense, if you're making a lot of money and you're not afraid of consequences, you're gonna continue doing what you're doing. There's also a high demand for cheap goods and cheap labors and traffickers realize that. So they meet that demand and make a profit by trafficking individuals. I also wanna point out uh, the complexities of supply chains. So for instance, this is a very simplistic graphic that I created um, just to show the supply chain of a simple cotton shirt. You can see there's many stages from getting the material um, out on a farm, to it being sewn together, to the material being dyed, to it hitting the shelf. There's a lot of steps involved. And in each of these steps, there could be hundreds of factories that are involved in producing that one shirt. So that, so the cotton can be grown in one country and it can be put together in a completely different country. So there's a lot going on. And these factories can also subcontract with other factories and the brand might not even know about it. So Recently, actually, to protect garment workers in the state of California, uh, California actually passed uh, an act that will better protect garment workers' wages by making sure uh, that brands and their suppliers actually have joint liability so that they don't finger point and say, hey, actually, that person owes the wages, that factory owes the wages, it's just joint liability to incentivize them to be better. So those are some of the reasons why labor, labor trafficking exists. Um, so some of the top industries in the United States are domestic servitude, traveling sales crews, and agriculture. Um, just a few things to point out. So agriculture, it's a big industry grossing $1 trillion, so a lot of profit. It's physically demanding, wages are low, limited to no benefits, and can be really dangerous. And agricultural communities don't just exist in rural areas, but urban ones as well. And that's because the work entailed goes beyond just the work of farmers. It includes handling, packing, and processing as well. And it can also be done in a nursery. Uh, immigrants comprise about 73% of the 2.6 farm workers in the US. And it's estimated from the USDA that 50% are undocumented immigrants, but other estimates show that to be much higher at 75%. Um, there's a lot of issues with the H3 visa, even though uh, farm workers uh, are aimed to be protected. Um, there's a lot of um, exploitation around that, offering exorbitant fees, and uh, they enter into situations of debt bondage where they're not actually able to pay off the fees that they think that they owe. And so they continue and continue to work and they can actually never meet that, de that debt. Um, the second biggest one is domestic work. So that includes live-in nannies, house cleaners, caregivers. And one of the reasons why it's so prevalent is that they're often not given contracts and it's not um, highly protected. So there's not like auditors coming into folks' houses all the time to check to make sure that um, the domestic workers are given fair wages and operating under safe conditions and treated fairly. Um, so there are different types of traffickers, I would say. They are, uh, one commonality is that they're exploitative, but it can be a slippery slope. It's not just that everyone is born evil. So when the pandemic started, for instance, Polaris Project had put out a warning um, to remind folks that if they do have a nanny, 
Don't just try to exploit them because the situation in the world has shifted. Don't just make them stay longer hours without compensating them. Don't um, treat them any differently than you would under normal circumstances um, because exploitation can be on a, a spectrum and we don't want to approach exploitation. You certainly don't want to approach trafficking either. Uh, then the third is traveling sales crews. So you might be wondering what tra uh, traveling sales crews are. That's usually the first question I get when I put up that list of common industries. Um, so it's definitely something that you've seen before, but we don't always have the language to associate what we're seeing. And that's very important so that we can pay attention to it on a daily basis. But uh, traveling sales crews uh, is just a group of individuals that go from place to place they're selling various items from magazines, trinkets, to candy, you name it. You might recognize traveling sales crews even on subways from children who say that they're on sports teams and they're trying to sell candy. It really depends. Um, so it's important to check our assumption. Sure, there are kids out there that just want to make extra money and that's fine, but you do wanna pay attention to warning signs and red flags, such as children that are working um, exorbitant hours. So let's say you enter the train for your morning commute and you see the kids out there doing that and then you come back hours later or even during school time and they're still out there doing the same thing. That might be a red flag to you, an adult that's close by and monitoring uh, kids that look nervous for instance, so these are some of the signs to pay attention to. And just a few differences I would point out between these three industries. So what we notice is that for traveling sales crews, the victims do tend to be domestic born and slightly younger. Whereas for agriculture and um, domestic servitude, the victims tend to be foreign born um, and slightly older. But of course there's folks from all walks of life, different backgrounds that can be labor traffic, sure. Um, one intersection that we've seen at Lifeway is between labor trafficking and those in forced marriages. So a forced marriage is simply a marriage that, sorry, my uh, throat got dry, but a marriage that one enters to that, sorry, let me drink water. Thinking about hot in here, but a marriage that someone enters and, um, they were forced to, or they entered it through fraudulent means, the same way that someone would enter into a different situation of exploitation or trafficking. So for instance, in one of our residents' uh, case, she was forced into a marriage, and then she was forced to sell, trink uh, sell trinkets and repair them. So that's an intersection that we've seen quite a bit about. So you could see how Someone might not be pigeonholed into one form of exploitation. Sometimes multiple forms intersect. Okay. Um, sometimes the role of service providers are overlooked um, in the recovery process. So we keep in mind that not only are folks uh, trafficked and it's a difficult situation, but it's also what happens next. So we recognize that the exploitation is horrible, the violence that maybe they've experienced is horrible, all of that, but it also compounds with the fact that sometimes their credit is disruptive, sometimes they don't have opportunities to build the re their resume in a way that they want. So take, for instance, the case that I talked about a second ago, that woman may feel that her experience isn't valuable enough to put on a resume. So in the safe house, we work very closely with the women to ensure that they can be on the path to independence. So that might mean just helping the woman translate that experience. There might be uh, important skills that they can put on a resume. Maybe it's reviewing the resume, identifying employers that they would be happy to work at. And uh, I've worked in different organizations, some with huge caseloads. And one of the nice things about the safe house is that we don't have a huge caseload, so we can focus specifically on the quality of care. So we're not just focused on placing the women in the first job that they get, but really thinking about uh, what might be meaningful to them. So it definitely ranges. And that's one of the more exciting parts about our job. 
And uh, from various research from survivors, uh, the economic uh, income building and financial literacy workshops are some of the top programs that they're interested in along with housing programs. Okay, and one last thing, I'm a huge supporter of fair trade. So I think it's important to practice what we preach and not just say that labor trafficking is a horrible thing, but also identify ways that we individually can make a difference. So one of the ways that I would encourage is exploring fair trade. There's different ways of becoming a conscious consumer, but fair trade is a very comprehensive model because it doesn't just support workers, but it also supports the environment and communities as well. So a lot of different values go into that label. It's audited by a third party. There's different types of fair trade auditors. Uh, as you can see on the screen, there's five on there. It doesn't matter which one, what matters is that you are paying attention to what you buy and not just thinking about yourself, but even in the office, right? So at Lifeway, we've committed to sourcing fair trade coffee in the offices and in the safe house. And it can start from there and it can go even bigger. So apologize for my throat getting a little dry earlier, but with that, I'll leave my contact information and I'll pass it on. Thank you so much, Tori. That was so informative um, and especially bringing in ethical consumerism as well, um, like what we can do as individuals to help um, not support uh, traffickers. Um, thank you very much. Um, next, I would like to introduce Anita Tika. She's the senior director of the anti-trafficking program at Safe Horizon. She oversees a dynamic multidisciplinary team of attorneys social workers, trainers, and administrative staff that provide holistic wraparound services to all victims of human trafficking. ATP clients are both sex and or labor trafficked. They comprise all genders, come from 80 countries. Anita also spearheads um, ATP's policy and advocacy efforts and represents the program in national, state, and local level coalitions, including co-chairing the Alliance to End Slavery and Trafficking, serving on the steering committee of Freedom Network USA, and supporting other labor rights coalitions. On behalf of ATP, Anita has lobbied in support of reauthorizing the Federal Trafficking Victims Protection Act. She co-leads the Brooklyn Human Trafficking Task Force with the Kings County District Attorney's Office and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the EDNY, the Eastern District of New York, and co-chairs the task force's labor subcommittee, which I've participated um, with her in, and she does an incredible job there. Um, prior to coming to Safe Horizons, Anita worked with child labor and sex trafficking victims and child laborers in the Philippines and was a litigator. Um, Anita, thank you for joining us and talking about your um, work with trafficking survivors. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks to the Queen's DA's office for hosting this panel and having all of us. I don't have any slides. I think I, I wanted to do more of an informal organic conversation. And I'm glad that Tori had referenced the H2A program, because I think we've been talking a lot in very granular aspects about different parts of labor trafficking. But I want to pull back and say that the U.S. temporary non-immigrant worker visa system is set up to do exactly what it actually results in. Massive amounts of, of migrant worker exploitation that can often lead to human trafficking. So it's doing, the system is doing exactly what it was meant to do. Bring over migrant workers from a plethora of different countries all around the world, pay them extremely low or no wages at rates way below what we would have paid uh, US workers in a number of different industries, and then deny those workers access to rights. So this is something we see every day. Most of the anti-trafficking programs clients are labor trafficked. And most of our clients, the vast majority of our clients came here through the non-immigrant worker visa system. So they came here on H2As or H2Bs or A3s or G5s or J1s. And I know I'm pulling out a lot of different letters and numbers, but if you look at the temporary non-immigrant worker visa system that we have in the United States, there are so many um, worker abuses and areas that are ripe for exploitation that are built in inherently into the system that it makes exploitation a given. It's inevitable. So some of the hallmarks of that temporary non-immigrant worker visa system include you can't change your employer. 
when you come over here on a particular visa. Whatever visa you come over on, for the most part, is tied to a particular employer because that employer petitions for you to come over. And so if that employer turns out to be exploitative or abusive, or you just want to leave because of one factor or another, you can't. If you leave that employer, as many of our clients have done because they have experienced abuse and exploitation, they're then out of status and now you're undocumented. And so I think at certain parts of, of the time in this country, being undocumented has posed more dangers than at other times, but certainly for migrant workers, being undocumented is one of the biggest stressors that our clients have cited. You, a lot of our worker clients have had to pay recruitment fees in the home country. And so this leads to what Tori referred to as debt bondage. We have clients who are told if you pay this much for this job opportunity, you know, $5,000 to get your visa to come from the Philippines to the United States, then this is how much you'll make. And you'll make the money back and you'll be able to send money home to your families. But when the workers get here, it's a very different story. The visa all of a sudden now costs $6,000. And they have to pay for their housing and they have to pay for food. They have to pay for transportation if they're not forced to live at the work site. They have to pay for their own safe, safety and health equipment if they're doing hazardous work. None of these pieces of the work are included. And so the costs associated with working are actually in the employer's favor because the employer makes money off of the workers. By the time our worker clients and, and a lot of our, our partners here have have similar clients in similar situations. By the time the workers have put in hundreds of hours of work each week, they come home with very little to nothing. And there are times where our clients will be working for months on end and not see a dime because it's all going to pay that debt that I mentioned before. That debt continues to accumulate exponentially. And so you are perpetually in debt bondage to your employer and there's no way to get out. And again, if your visa ties you to your employer and you leave your employer, you're out of status. So it makes it very difficult for workers to escape or to mitigate an abusive situation. We've also seen employers blacklisting employees if they complain about work conditions. And so we've seen that there are generations in families in different countries around the world who migrate to the US for seasonal work through the temporary non-immigrant worker visa system. And that is how they support their families for the entire year. So you might have generations of a family in Mexico who typically come over to the US and they might pick berries under an H-2A visa during the seasonal time for that crop. They make their money if they're, you know, fingers crossed, not exploited or trafficked, and they actually are paid a fair wage. And they go home and they support their families with the earnings that they made in the United States. But we've seen that if workers speak out against any exploitative or abusive situation, they can be blacklisted by that employer, which means they will not be included as a potential worker to bring over under an H-2A visa for that employer ever again. And those names can be circulated among different employers within work industries. And so now that worker or those workers from even just one family have no means of securing or generating any form of income that that family has relied on for years and years. And so it's it's another incentive to not speak out against abusive conditions. We also have workers who have worked very long hours for low pay in hazardous conditions, unsanitary housing. A lot of our clients were forced to live in group um, areas where there's multiple people to one particular house or a room, or they were forced to live on the premises where they worked. We had a number of clients who were trafficked within a hotel chain from state to state. And those individuals were forced to sleep in the maintenance room. And the guests of the hotel would have no idea. Guests of a hotel don't walk into the maintenance room of the hotel to see that that's where the housekeeping staff is. And that's where the, the regular hotel staff are, are forced to live because they don't have any other options. One of the key hallmarks of the temporary non-immigrant worker visa system um, as a consequence of the way that it's been set up is that you can't collectively organize or bargain. And so in the United States, depending on the industry, we have a really strong collective bargaining and union system, not in all industries, but in some, and Estelle, let me touch on that. But with these workers, because of all of the, the coercive methods that are on the table that prohibit or prevent somebody from speaking out against abusive conditions, 
the workers are not going to collectively organize and bargain. And more importantly, workers don't know what their rights are in the United States if you are a migrant worker. Even if you are born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Queens, New York, wherever, you don't necessarily know what the labor laws are that apply to you. When I was working in the Philippines, I had no idea what my rights were as a worker. So it's, and I'm an attorney working in the Philippines. And if, if I don't know, and if those of us who have access to resources and educational opportunities in that way that we have that inherent privilege are not able to educate ourselves or don't educate ourselves, then how can we expect individuals who don't have access to those resources and those learning opportunities to know what their rights are when they come over to the US? And once you do know what your rights are, the system is set up to prevent you from ever acting upon enforcement of your rights. Um, I also wanna note that the US government continues to increase the cap numbers for all of these different temporary visa categories each year. And so for some of the labor coalitions that I'm in, we're actually advocating against increasing the caps. So there are caps on how many workers can be brought in under the H-2A, the H-2B, and so on, all of those different visa categories. Because what we've seen is that you have increasing numbers of workers who are being brought into the U.S. <clears throat> under this temporary non-immigrant worker visa system, and the exploitation and the abuses continue to increase without a resulting recognition and, and enforcement of worker rights protections. So in effect, you have more people who are subject to abusive working conditions without the resulting worker rights protections that those workers are entitled to. So given that we are working in a terrible system that is doing exactly what it was set up to do, cheap labor, to fuel a number of industries within the US at a cost that is only ever beneficiary towards the employer, what can we do in terms of advocacy at the federal level? And it might, you know, I think within the anti-trafficking program, the reason that we have incorporated so much advocacy in the work that we do is because we know that when we see workers from Mexico coming through our doors as human trafficking survivors, we have to address the systemic reasons, and I think Alex will go into this a bit more, as to how that person came to our office. If we don't address things at the source, that flood of clients will never stop. And I think for all of us, our goal is to end human trafficking. And I have my own thoughts on that in terms of the human nature of people. And I think there are opportunities where people can do certain things to exploit others, and they do. Just because you can doesn't mean you should, but people do. And I think people will continue to do it because it's so easy and there's so much impunity and there's so much profit at the same time. So with respect to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, this is the seminal bill that first um, established human trafficking as a crime at the federal level back in 2000. The TVPA for short needs to be reauthorized every few years. Currently, we are in a reauthorization period. So I am working in coalition to insert particular provisions within the TVPRA such that we can strengthen worker rights protections. Um, so those include whistleblower protections for workers who are reporting forced labor, including protection from deportation. We were also trying to get in a Department of State orientation program for diplomatic workers and employees of uh, foreign government employees and international organization employees so that when those workers came into the U.S., they had an on-arrival orientation program so they knew what their rights were and they were given referrals, referral information should they ever need it down the road. There would be Department of State and Department of Labor check-ins with those workers during the course of their employment. And then upon exit of the worker, when the work contract was up but before the person left the country, Department of State and Department of Labor would conduct an exit interview with that worker, knowing that workers tend to be more candid about the realities of their work situation when they no longer have to fear any reprisals from their employer because they're leaving and the contract has been concluded. The last piece I want to talk about is the Foreign Labor Recruitment Act. This is a bill that we are anticipating will be introduced hopefully at the end of the month by Senator Blumenthal. It's something that I've been working in coalition with support for years and it's pre-existed my time working in this field. But this bill is incredibly important because it would ban recruitment fees. You should not have to pay to work. 
And that's what our clients have experienced. They have to get into debt with money they don't have to pay for the opportunity to work. And that opportunity does not always amount to a higher quality of living. It can lead to degradation, sexual and physical abuse, psychological trauma and harm, becoming undocumented, and a whole plethora of other adverse consequences. Just because somebody wanted the opportunity to improve their life. So with the FLR, like I said, it would ban recruitment fees, which would get at the issue of <clears throat> the creation of debt bondage. It would require all foreign labor recruiters to register. So we keep track of who the recruiters are, what they're doing, and how they're interacting with potential employees on behalf of their employers. It would require worker contracts laying out all of the specifics of the job in the worker's language, and it would also include fines and direct liability for the recruiters and for the employers. Because at times, and this goes back to what Tori was mentioning regarding supply chains, there's so much opaqueness in supply chains that oftentimes the employers will turn around and say, I didn't know what the recruiters were doing when they were recruiting workers on our behalf to come work at our hotel chain or in our, in our restaurant. We didn't know. And so this would create direct liability for the employers that they knew or should have known what their employment recruiters were doing. So these are just a, a touch of the different um, policy work that we're doing at the federal level to combat some of the root causes that are inherent in our, <laughs> our own migration and immigration system. But to know that most of our workers came here as legal non-immigrant migrant workers, they didn't, most clients didn't come here undocumented. And the irony was that they wound up in a situation that was even more abusive and exploitative because of the way the system was set up. Thanks all. Thank you so much, Anita, for that informing, informing presentation. Um, and even, and thank you for mentioning um, the problem of labor trafficking with the um, diplomatic employees. You know, we live very close to the UN. We've had many cases come in involving diplomats, uh, trafficking, household labor, um, and child care. So thank you for bringing that up and for answering um, that question. I do want to bring up before introducing the next uh, speaker, we have two more speakers left, and I encourage you to try to stay on if your schedule permits, because they really round out the presentation so wonderfully um, that what uh, that traffickers often use threats of deportation and fear to control someone who's trafficked not to report. But the reality of the fact is there are a lot of organizations like Safe Horizons and like the district attorney's offices who can connect them to legal, um, legal services um, to help their immigration status. I can't tell you how many countless um, labor trafficking victims we've had, we've worked with, where their status has gotten improved during the course of reporting the trafficking, where we've gotten T visas in support of keeping someone here because someone's been trafficked, where we've gotten continuing legal presence and even gotten been able to obtain family members coming to the U.S. for safety. So there are benefits in reporting um, the trafficking to law enforcement. So I just wanted to mention that at this point because um, it seems like a good time to include it. Next, I want to introduce Alexander Garcia, who is winning the award for the most modest panelist in his bio, because it's by far the shortest, but given the work he does, I know this is very modest. Um, Alexander Garcia is the manager of the Workers' Rights Program at the New Immigrant Community Empowerment, NICE, um, New York NICE, where he supports day laborers and newly arrived immigrants with worker rights issues. Um, this is an on the ground um, organization. He's a graduate of the, the Rogel College Center for Chinese Studies and the, Un the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us, Alexander Garcia. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all so much for being here and thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here with all of you and it's been so informative. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, and, you know, I, I can definitely see how all of our fields overlap and are interconnected um, and how they intersect. Um, so a little bit about us, uh, my organization, a New Immigrant Community Empowerment. We're a nonprofit community-based organization here in Jackson Heights, Queens. Um, we're two blocks down from 69th and Roosevelt, which is one of the largest day labor stops in New York City. Um, you know, you could go down from pretty much from Woodside Avenue all the way to all the way to Broadway, and you will see laborers all throughout. 
many of them just waiting for an opportunity to find work. Um, and as you may, may imagine, many of them are newly arrived. And as something that I feel like has been echoed here is the precarious economic situation that many of the people find themselves in, which drives them to unfortunately look for labor and withhold and tolerate terrible working conditions. Um, as I, as I was, uh, suggested, as I was uh, saying earlier, we work mostly with day laborers um, and we advocate for dignified workplaces everywhere. Um, you know, our motto is like, you know, our, um, if you worked, uh, our work, our paid. It sounds better in Spanish, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but that's one of our models, right? Um, but I just kind of want to talk about, right, which is the intersection of labor and trafficking. And, and really some of it is the, the opaqueness of it in which many of our, many of the, of the cases that we deal with here, right, are kind of in, a, in, a, say, in an area which is a gray area, right? Maybe you could be like, that's not trafficking, that is trafficking. Um, and which which allows you know for us I have to think a particular fun kind of exploitation that is very cruel and difficult to report and difficult to address. Um, something else that I definitely want to address and talk about is uh, the situation in which I think has also been echoed, echoed here is that um, this kind of trafficking is what makes it incredibly insidious is that it is I think the popular representations that we have seen of trafficking um, as Jessica Martin, Jessica mentioned earlier is oh, you know, people crossing straight lines, people like being in like shady places. Trafficking is everywhere, <laughs> you know? It is, it is at your side, your door, it is at your deli. Um, as people mentioned earlier, it is, at the, it is at the 69th and Roosevelt stop, even though they're out there, you know, on their own, you would imagine looking for work. It is everywhere. It is the person delivering your paper. Um, it is the person delivering your DoorDash order. Um, and that's something that we see, right? And I think what, we're, what we try to address is the fact that there is a lack of education around that which is why these things are able to happen. Um, I also don't have a PowerPoint presentation ready. I'm kind of just gonna do like a dialogue and just bring up some examples of the situations that we deal with. Um, so often right here at our organization, people would come, people will come to us um, with a, what seems like an issue of wage stuff. They'll be like, oh, you know, my employer hasn't paid me. They're withholding wages. Um, and it's my job to, you know, to help them recover those wages. And it becomes an issue in which I just like scratch the surface to see what is happening. And then as I dig deeper and I ask more questions, what is revealed is an, an incredibly insidious situation in which many of these people, um, many of these workers are really in a situation in which they're being forced to work under the threat of, with, not only under the threat of that, well, we'll hold your wages. You know, if you talk to anyone, if you tell anyone about this, what's going on. And I mean, and this is like a situation in which people have been working for like months at an employer. And, and I really love the, uh, Cor um, Dr. Coraline's earlier statement about trauma, you know, mm -hmm. about how people were like, why do they do this? And it's like, from, I can totally understand from their perspective, if they leave this job, they're never going to get paid. If they leave the situation, they're never going to get their money. Um, but as we speak to them more, right, it turns out not only are their wages being withheld, but their documents are being withheld. Or that employer will also be like, if you look for help, I'm going to call ICE on you. Right. Um, and that often leads to situations in which, for example, I'll bring up an example that of a particular worker. Um, we had a worker come by in which they came by for a wage theft situation. And, it, and as I asked them about it, it turned out that they had been, um, not only had like a month worth, a month's worth of wages withheld, but they were also taking cross state lines to Miami, to Florida, Miami, and they were dropped off there and just abandoned there. So they weren't paid and they were like, well, and the worker had no idea where they were. They had no idea how to get back. They were newly arrived immigrants, you know, and, and they had to make their way back from Florida to New York City, right? And, and this is someone who was looking for construction work, right? This is someone who was right there on 69th and Roosevelt. You'll see them pass by. Uh, you'll see them if you walk by, but you would never imagine, you know, how, how deep, how terrible, like the, the terrible things they might have to um, endure. Um, another situation that we see a lot, right, is the situation in which domestic day laborers or cleaning ladies, right, um, in which many of them are recruited often online, right? Um, I, I'm sure many of you have seen the Facebook ads, you know, or maybe I think um, there's a particular cleaning company right now that I'm working on, trying to figure out what's going on, what's going on. But uh, this is a situation in which they, they send many of these ladies to go work for for weeks at a time and they also have to pay the same kind of fees and at the same time you know they're bundled up and forced to live in one place their employer is the person responsible for transporting them 
And at the end of the day, their employer will like not only refuse to pay them, but also, you know, kind of keep things incredibly, um, keep them in, in incredible, terrible situations. I mean, terrible living conditions to kind of exacerbate them and force them to continue to work for them, right? And I feel like, um, you know, when we when we try to address these issues and we try to speak to these ladies or speak to people who have gone, gone through the situation, there is like a, a the situation in which people feel like, oh, what you went through is not trafficking, you know, because you were getting paid. Um, or that's often the response that they give me themselves, like, oh, no, no, that, no, eso no me paso. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, I, I think you, this is not, I mean, I think you were, are being in a trafficking situation. And I kind of go down the list with them, you know, but there's like um, this trauma bond that, that Dr. Car I mean, Dr. Carline's presentation was awesome. I loved it, really. I was just like, wow, I see it all, you know, I, what you talked about, I see it here every day, you know, when I speak to people, like literally, including the, the lack of an ability to create a, a timeline, their inability to recall things. Then they're how they continue to make what would people would say, why did you make those terrible decisions? You know, and it's really fueled by like one, the trauma and also the lack of economic security. Three, you know, obviously our immigrant system, which allows these things to happen. And, and four, I think the lack of protections for immigrant workers, right? In particular, um, newly arrived immigrants who are undocumented or what people would say, you know, I mean, to use a more terrible term, you know, yeah, like illegal, right? Um, and, and I feel like in order to move forward with this kind of situation and to kind of address it, we have to address the systemic issues that give rise to this. Um, and I feel, I, I, I think earlier someone mentioned, for example, I think it was Tori about the, was it Tori? I'm sorry, about the joint um, liability. Yes, yes, and the joint liability, right? And that's something that we feel can help a lot in addressing in particular um, labor trafficking when it comes to day labor and construction workers. Because often what we see, right, when construction workers are found in construction sites and they are working really under, under the threat of ICE, under the threat of withholding wages, under the threat of, of blackmail, um, is a lack of liability because of the way that our construction industry, which, by the way, in New York City, um, more than 50 percent of construction work is done by undocumented workers. It's, it's, not, it's not done by union labor anymore. It's done by undocumented workers, you know. Um, and a lot of it is this issue in which employers can rid them, for example, um, there is a situation in which uh, there is no liability for anyone. No one's responsible. You ask the worker, who's your employer? I don't know. Who's the person responsible for paying you? I don't know. Who is, who is responsible for taking you? Like, who, where, are you, where are you working at? I don't know. You know, and, and it's just, and then when we figure out and we look at it and it turns out it's like the Virgin Hotel or something, which is a huge place, right? There's a lack of liability in which the very person at the top can say, I had no idea this was going on because of the way the construction industry is particularly, um, uh, the, the system of the construction industry here in New York City, right? Uh, so definitely I feel like creating some kind of legislation that will be able to address like a joint liability in which not only will the general contractor at the very top be responsible, but the subcontractors, the day laborer brokers, everyone who's responsible for creating and enabling the system of, of, lab of labor and human trafficking of construction workers. Um, and, and I just kind of want to end it on that, right? And, and to really emphasize that what we, what we imagine to be, in, like I said, in popular representation is not true. It is everywhere um, in a way that is incredibly, incredibly saddening to do, to do but, but you know, I feel also empowering because if, if it's everywhere, then we can advocate every day to, to change these conditions. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Alex, for your work every day and for, for just highlighting the challenges um, we face in combating trafficking and identifying um, who, who is responsible. Um, thank you so much. Um, last but not least, I want to introduce Estelle Davis. Believe it or not, it's, I was thinking last night how ironic it is, Estelle, that you're the anchor on our program because when we started organizing this, you were the first person I thought of um, to participate, number one. Um, but that's why I'm glad you're wrapping it all up. Estelle and I go way back in the anti-trafficking space. Estelle was one of the original, you know, the OGs in the trafficking space, but we're not going to talk about that because that would date us both. And we are much too uh, youthful and innovative to do that. <laughs> so we'll agree not to. Um, Estelle is counsel to the Division of Immigrant Policies and Affairs at the New York State Department of Labor. Um, in this role, she coordinates investigations of possible human trafficking 
interviewing potential claimants and provides those eligible with state confirmation and referrals for U or two visa, a U or T visa certifications using victim-centered approaches. Uh, she also manages community outreach to immigrant communities on New York State um, Department of Labor areas of service labor law and anti-labor trafficking services. She's fluent in Spanish and has worked in legal services for 22 years. Um, Estelle, thank you for sharing um, your expertise um, on this topic. Thanks, Jessica. I think I dated myself in my yeah, bio. <laughs> I know. Um, so thank you, everybody. And it's been really such a pleasure to hear all the presenters saying so many things that, you know, We've, we talk about over the years, some of them we talk about from a social work perspective, and some of them we talk about from a um, legal perspective, from what's the, you know, penal law statute we can cite, and then also to hear about them from a psychological perspective, the brain chemistry and putting it all together, and also, you know, the organizing perspective. Um, how do you take a group of workers and um, who are entirely disempowered and find group identity and be able to stand up together and feel safer standing up together. Um, so it's just such a great, such a great collection of people and the make a policy. And I really appreciate um, the chance to be here to talk about it. So some of the things that I was going to address, I feel like we've covered throughout the presentation. So I'm going to um, just go over really quickly I think the first thing I was asked to talk about is the difference between worker exploitation versus labor trafficking. And I think this is a really critical one, first of all, because worker exploitation is not a defined legal concept. Um, the same way that wage theft is more of a policy statement, but it's a, this, the actual violation would be a minimum wage violation. So I'm just gonna go in really quickly to what the Department of Labor does. We investigate New York State labor law violations. So that is failure to pay minimum wage, failure to pay overtime, failure to pay for all hours somebody worked or things like tip appropriation. Um, there's some other nuances in there. You know, if somebody, um, let's say, um, is required, is told it's mandatory to have certain equipment, then the employer should pay for that equipment. They either have to provide it or they should pay it. Um, these laws that we're just going over, these labor laws apply regardless of immigration status. So no matter how new somebody is to New York, they are entitled to all of those labor law protections. I think Alex brought this up, and this has been very true in my experience as well, is that particularly new immigrants are vulnerable. They're vulnerable to their employer telling them, oh, those laws don't apply to you. Oh, if you call the cops, the cops are just going to turn you into immigration. And they don't have other conflicting information to say that's not true. And so, you know, once they've been here a little longer and they talk to their friends, and their friends say that's not true. I know somebody who, you know, went to NICE and got a uh, urban justice attorney to represent them or went to the Department of Labor and got a settlement. You know, I think once people have other information, then they can conflict what the employer says. But in the beginning, the employer can be the entire source of information. And if the employer tells you, you don't have any rights here, I'll call immigration on you and you'll get deported. You know, you'll have to pay a bunch of money. Um, then that, that's the, the truth that they're relying on in making decisions. Um, so the Department of Labor enforces labor laws and we do it through field investigations. So if we receive a complaint from an individual, we can go to that work site, we interview all employees present and we can ask them about labor law violations. If we get an allegation that there's potential trafficking, we also do what we call a know your rights screening. So, you know, we may ask a couple trafficking related questions, but mainly what we're doing is saying, you have the right not to be threatened. Um, you have the right not to be assaulted by your employer. You know, these are in addition to being, you know, whatever labor law violation is going on is a potential criminal act and that there are services available. And there are also, um, you know, potential visas for individuals who cooperate with law enforcement in the investigation and detection of these crimes. And we provide them um, with, a hotline number 
we provide them with the national hotline number. Our materials also all contain also contain my cell phone number. Um, when we get the, the contact link at the end, I included um, the website that has our anti-trafficking materials for the DOL. And we have both palm cards that are designed to be given out to workers in 12 different languages. When we do these field sites, we give the individuals these cards. And we also have a flyer that's more of a three-page trifold that's targeted more towards nonprofit organizations. And it has a lot of the potential indicators of trafficking that we've discussed today. And it also contains um, the wheel of power that the doctor put up. We put in some of those specifically in terms of you know, what somebody might say that's manipulative. Um, I think we've given a lot of examples. Um, you know, kind of unusual level of control by the by the employer saying you can't leave the work site without permission or the employer entirely controlling transportation, um, you know, saying you can't talk about what happens at work, things like that. So, um, you know, there's specific examples in the flyer that's targeted towards um, more service providers about trafficking. So I would say Going back to, um, so we, in the field, we do go out, we do do trafficking screening. Um, we don't expect people to self-identify surrounded by their coworkers and protectively, you know, a manager that, you know, maybe is actually related to one of their coworkers. Like that is not a situation where somebody is going to disclose. Um, you know, what we do in those situations is we, I introduce myself to them. I give them my name and number and say, you know, I'm here if you want to talk, if you want to ask questions about what would happen if, you know, if you want to talk through the scenario and we can give you more information so that you can make an informed decision about what your next steps will be. Um, so we do that in the field and we also screen the complaints that we get to the DOL. So very often there'll be something included in the facts saying that I you know, worked for this employer for 10 years, I never had a day off. Um, living situation, we brought that up as a potential flag for trafficking. We've had cases where it was an individual who was living in the basement of a bodega. It's an unfinished basement, no bathroom, no, you know, basically a sink that he could use. He had a cot, no heating, no insulation. Um, and his employer told him, um, nobody else will help you the way I help you. I gave you some place to live for free. I'm the good guy here. You know, I'm, you know, nobody else will do this for you. And he believed him. Um, and he was working 80 hours a week. And I think he was getting paid about $5 an hour. And I think he worked for seven years without a single day off. And then he had a health issue and asked for a day off and the employer fired him. And when he filed a complaint with the Department of Labor, he included some of these details. And in the course of that getting screened by our investigators, it got referred to my division as potential trafficking. Um, so we screen all the complaints that come in. Um, anything that says threat of immigration can go to me. It also goes to our anti-retaliation unit. We will work with that individual to refer them to a service provider. Um, we work with the New York State um, Trafficking Victim Referral Program, and that also refers the individuals to service providers. And we also make referrals to criminal law enforcement. Um, Jessica and I have worked together on a number of cases. Um, and then, so we, we do the investigations, um, we do screening of complaints that come in. And the third way that we get cases is we get referrals from immigration attorneys who are looking for a U or T visa certification. So this is an individual who's already out of the situation and this question came up in the chat, so I just wanted to say the Department of Labor um, statute of limitations, how far we can go back on claims is six years from the date it's filed. So if you have somebody who was working in New York State that had a labor law violation or um, something that you think might rise to the level of labor trafficking, um, we can go back six years. If it's outside of our six-year statute of limitation, we'll still, you know, screen the case, refer them to a service provider, refer them to criminal law enforcement, um, you know, and it's always the individual's choice. You know, we can do a warm handoff where I say, here is, um, you know, Anita at Safe Horizon, and, you know, she knows you're going to call, she has your contact information, or, you know, Alex at NICE, we can do these warm handoffs. Um, if that's what the individual says that they want. If they say, no, I'm good, I don't want to talk about it anymore, we say, we're still here, that's your choice. 
you know, you get to make the decisions. Um, so in differentiating between worker exploitation and labor trafficking, um, this is an example, I apologize if, if I've used it before, but I thought it was such a, it's a good example of, um, this was an individual who was an agricultural worker. And when he first started, it was his first job in the US and this was upstate New York. And he came in and, you know, he was a hard worker and his employer um, kept giving him more and more responsibility. So pretty soon he was not just doing the field work, he was also helping manage the packing plant. And, um, you know, his job duties increased. He was working all the time. He was living in employer provided housing. And yet he was still being paid minimum wage. And so he was now in charge. He was now having to make these complicated decisions. He was running things. He was being held accountable, but he wasn't getting any corresponding benefit from that. I would call that exploitation. You know, as his duties increased, his his wages should have increased. Um, or, you know, there can be, um, he could have um, other types of benefits that went along with it, but still the wages, I think, are really the primary one. Um, but that so that situation I would call exploitation. I would call it wage theft. If an individual, you know, let's say works in a restaurant and are told they have to clock out at five o'clock every day, but they still have to work those two extra hours to do all the cleanup, that's still working hours. You know, not paying them for those hours is wage theft. It's a violation of the labor law. What makes something trafficking is going back to force, fraud, or coercion. So is it a threat of physical force? Um, is it a fraud, fraudulent future promise of a benefit? We get cases where an individual is told, oh, I'll help you apply for a green card. And, um, you know, that sort of future promise is used to keep them staying in a situation that's exploitative. You know, they keep working long hours, they keep not getting paid what they're promised. Or another one I see is an employer who says, oh, I can't afford to right now. The pandemic really made it hard for me, but I'll pay you next month. And so then that individual acts in reliance on that promise and stays in the job and doesn't get paid. And meanwhile, their own bills are piling up, but they've acted in reliance of this promise from the employer that they're going to get paid in the future. Now, if the employer has no intention of doing that, that's fraud. Coercion is the one we talk about the most. That's the threats. Um, you know, it can be threats to revoke a visa if it's somebody who's here on an employer, you know, sponsored visa. It can be threat to turn somebody into immigration. It can be a threat to disclose a secret, any of those types of threats. And that's really the most common one we see. So I would differentiate between, um, you know, exploitation, which isn't necessarily a legal term, and labor trafficking, where we can apply the definition and there is, you know, it's a class D felony and a labor law violation where we can go after the wages and fines, um, things like that. So the last thing I wanted to leave you with is um, I went through a little bit of our um, referrals that we've had in, in the last five years. And it looks like we've had about 50 um, allegations of potential trafficking that were taking place in Queens. Um, eight of those um, on closer, you know, talking to the individuals were unsubstantiated. They didn't really meet the criteria for trafficking. Um, one of the scenarios that we get often is that an individual, um, you know, potentially has wage theft issues that have been going on. They confront their employer um, and the employer responds by, you know, it could be a future promise. We've also had instances where the employer responds by assaulting the worker, um, a physical assault, and those we screen for potential U visas based on assault, um, or, you know, fires them. And then when the individual says, well, I'm going to file a complaint with the Department of Labor, then they threaten to call immigration on them. So that scenario is not going to be trafficking because the threat comes after the work is done. Now, if that person goes back to work for another week, you know, we can look at potentially whether or not they're continuing, um, they were induced to continue labor through that coercive threat of um, immigration consequences. But if it is somebody who is fired and then they threaten to call immigration, we can't necessarily look at it for trafficking. There are other things, you know, if there is a Department of Labor complaint, we look at it for obstruction of justice. We look at it for witness tampering. Um, we look at whether or not there is some other lesser included crime 
that might make this person eligible for a U visa. Um, okay, so we have, going back to the stats on Queens, um, nine of them resulted in either U or T visa certifications being issued. And um, about a third of them were food service workers. So primarily restaurant workers. Um, there was also another question earlier about you know, cases specifically in Queens, in what industries they occur. Um, the next biggest one is construction. Um, and that includes both day laborers. It can also include supers. We've had a handful of cases that were supers in buildings that were living in very poor conditions. And, you know, if you look at that, it's exactly that scenario where the employer controls the housing. And that's a lot of control for the employer to have over this individual. Um, beauty salons, um, domestic workers, some retail cases, some massage parlor, and then just a couple of um, hospitality hotel workers, um, some healthcare, home health aides. Um, and then we had one case that involved um, a um, horse, the, a horse race. Um, I can't think of the word for it, but uh, yeah, it was a- A jockey? It, it wasn't a jockey, it's um, staff that do care for the horses, yeah. Um, so, you know, these are the types of industries that we've seen, um, we've had allegations of potential trafficking in. Um, let's see. I think that pretty much wraps it up. The last thing I was gonna say is that there was a question about how to report to the Department of Labor. And I would say, just report it to me. You know, if it's something that we um, cannot take on, we will screen it, provide appropriate referrals. Um, if it is a labor law violation, you know, we can help the person with getting the um, claim form filed. Um, if it's more appropriate for a criminal referral, we will make that referral as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Estelle, for just illuminating the scope of the problem with real examples. I think that helps us all a lot. Before concluding, because I know we went so far over time, but this was so much incredible information in a short amount of time, I just want to introduce Detective Liam O'Hara, and I'm going to pose one of the questions in our chat to him. Um, an anonymous attendee asked that they've seen children working on train stations late at night with their, uh, I guess, apparent mothers who seem undocumented. How should we approach those situations and how do we know if it's trafficking or just um, undocumented persons um, in poverty situations? You're muted, Liam. Sorry about that. Thank you, Jessica. Um, it's a good question, and it's it's not an easy answer, right? Because how could you possibly tell just by looking um, at a mother and a child what really the situation uh, that's going on there? And um, the fact that it's happening in the subway, the scenario that was given, calls to mind, um, you know, the ad campaign, if you see something, say something. So how do you know a briefcase left on the platform is a dangerous device or just a briefcase left on a platform? You can't know as, as a citizen, but it never hurts to call it in. So there are various numbers that I believe Jessica uh, told me were listed as part of the um, information, part one, one of the slides uh, that goes along with this seminar. Um, you could call uh, Crime Stoppers. You could call the National uh, Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, if you see what you believe amounts to a possible emergency situation, child abuse or neglect, you could call 911. Um, you could call Ms. Davis, the last panelist, or, or, or contact her as she put her information out there. Um, and you're never wrong uh, to, to call it in if you think that there, whether it's the scenario that was provided or any other um, situation where it just strikes you as odd. And New Yorkers, we do have an intuition about these kinds of things. Um, if you see something uh, that, that stands out to you or rubs you the wrong way, it never hurts to call it in. And we never mind going out on any call and doing our job, which is to investigate and determine whether or not there is some sort of criminality. Thank you, Detective O'Hara. 
Um, and you can call the district attorney's office directly as well. Um, our numbers are going to be shared. I know um, Anna has a slide with all of our contact information, but we take anonymous calls as well, and we work with um, Detective O'Hara's um, human trafficking team citywide to make sure um, all of our cases are investigated. Um, before concluding, um, I was notified by Brooklyn Queens National Organization for Women that they're also hosting a trafficking awareness event tonight from six to seven. So if you go to Brooklyn Queens Now's website, you can register for that um, if you haven't had enough trafficking um, information for one day. I just want to thank all of the presenters for joining. I really, I mean, I learn something new at every event I attend or speak at, and I learned so much on this one, and I just thank you all for collaborating with us and for sharing your information um, with our group. Um, I just want to say that as a takeaway, if you are ever, ever been a victim or you are in contact with a victim, we want you to know at the Queens DA's office and our Human Trafficking Bureau that we're here to help regardless of immigration status, social, economic status. Um, nobody's ever been penalized for coming into our office to report that they were a victim of a crime or trafficking, or even now if you're not ready to report, if you just wanted to be connected to help and services and discuss options in reporting. Our doors are open to everyone. If you need any presentations in your respective communities on trafficking, um, we've been going out to a lot of different areas, to the Queens Medical Society, to schools, um, to groups, just educating about trafficking in general please reach out at the Human Trafficking Bureau email, which is humantrafficking at queensda.org, or our phone number at 718-286-6548. There were some unanswered questions, but we are over time. I'm going to try to reach out tomorrow morning and get direct answers to any of the remaining questions that were left in the chat. Thank you so much for your attention and taking the time out of your days to attend. Oh. <sighs>